In issue 19, because of an assassination attempt on Ladama, Brenda finds out who her aunt is. She is naturally none too pleased, not only that her aunt is a murderer, but that her friends knew and didn't tell her. Fortunately, Hector, Nadia, and Jaime's mom are around to talk to her about all of this. The things they reveal to her are really what's important. Ladama has been decreasing her illegal activities over the last five years. Hector and Nadia admit that they're jealous of Brenda's relationship with Jaime because he talks about her all the time, how he respects her so much and doesn't want to let her down. Jaime loves Brenda. Not in a romantic way. Paco might be his best guy friend, but Brenda is also his best friend. She has that kind of effect on people, and they were worried that if they told her the truth, they'd lose her forever. The next two issues are about character development as well. First for Peacemaker, not really important for the moment, and the next for Jaime, where he faces down the specter and really shows concern about the level of power he has at his disposal, especially implying that if he ever killed someone or did something truly wrong, with his power, well, let's just say he won't need the Spectre to deliver righteous vengeance. Following that, we discover that a bunch of the standalone issues we had seen previously actually weren't standalone, but in fact pieces of the puzzle for the Reach's plan for Earth. Which really, in my humble opinion, is how comics should handle story arcs. Let each individual issue stand on their own, beginning, middle, and end, but contain enough elements that, when you bring them together, they form a larger tapestry. Or, you know, we could just shove out six issues together and hope it feels like a complete story when it's all said and done. That works, too! Long story short, they're slowly infecting the world with a chemical that's phase-shifted out of our dimension. It's in too minute a quantity to detect, but it'll stay in our systems and build up over the course of a hundred years. The Reach are patient. They'll wait a century, create a fake disaster, and activate the chemical that's a subtle mind control agent. The Reach will offer humanity a way out of the disaster, and since they've been programmed and lived with the Reach for the last century, humanity will become a slave race and the planet strip mined as payment for their help. Fortunately, Jaime has a bit of an advantage here. As you can tell by the fact that the Reach's world-conquering plans are meant to occur over the course of a century, they're very anal-retentive about their plans and schedules. Jaime and his Scarab are the first time an infiltrator has gone rogue, so they have no idea how to deal with him. Even similar plans that they want to implement are rejected because of things like parameters or doesn't match planetary type. Unfortunately, that also means that they don't really have the luxury of time. The longer they wait to deal with the Reach, the more likely they'll be able to pull a plan together to deal with him. Jaime comes up with his own plan first. It's dangerous, risky, insane, and probably will get him killed. But in case the last two weeks worth of material hasn't made it clear, dangerous, risky, insane, and potentially lethal plans are really what the Blue Beetle is all about. Utilizing the same dimension shifting he had done after Infinite Crisis, Jaime shifts himself into a limited form of time travel, appearing in three places at once, when really they're just 0.5 milliseconds off from each other. He then exposes three of the machines intended to cause the disaster on Earth to the public. The Reach quickly hide them all again, but doing so allows him to triangulate the position of the hidden Reach mothership, which Jaime flies up to. He attacks, but the Reach are able to distract him by attacking his family's house and then transmit a shutdown sequence to the Scarab, the negotiator physically ripping the Scarab from his back. And here's where it all comes together, my friends. Issues 24 and 25. All the supporting characters, the development between Jaime and the Scarab, and of course Jaime himself, it all comes down to this. Hey, can you guess what my third and fourth favorite issues of this book are? Tracy 13 arrives to save Jaime's family from the Reach attack while Jaime, naked and powerless, escapes from the Reach cell. The Scarab gave him information about the ship to use here, but the Scarab itself isn't any help powerless and taken to a lab to be hooked up to their computers for analysis. The Reach discover Jaime's family survived and send down an attack force to deal with them. Fortunately, Tracy summons a deadly weapon. Bees. My god. That's what I love about this series. I don't even have to tell any jokes about it. It's doing it for me.
Peacemaker and the posse arrive to back up Tracy while Jaime steals a fighter so he can fly it inside of the ship and destroy the mothership's engines. Because apparently the Reach hired the same people who created the Scimitar and Star Trek Nemesis to build their spaceships. Hallways wide enough to fit a small spacecraft through. Oh, and of course, Ladama and her forces also come to fight the Reach. The Reach prevent Jaime from destroying their engine core, but he releases some sort of code into their computers that they can't decipher. Taking Jaime prisoner again, he only proclaims two words. Kaji da. Issue 25 brings us the story from the Scarab's point of view. Dan Garrett activated the Scarab by yelling Kaji Da, but the Scarab lacked the full programming to give the complete infiltrator technology effect. The Scarab was then damaged, so Ted saying the words wouldn't work. But Jaime yells those words and activates the Scarab. Kaji Da is not a command. It's the Scarab's serial number. Its name. And so the Scarab wakes up and flies out to Jaime, merging with him again to fight the Reach. Jaime reveals their true plan. The code in their computers? It is gibberish. But it was a great distraction for them. After they hooked up Kajida to their computer, it was able to access it and transmit all of the Reach's invasion plans to Earth. Jaime coordinated the plan with Batman. How did he do so when the Reach were monitoring all electronic communication on Earth? Simple. He wrote a letter. See, sometimes retro is the way to go. Why am I not playing this on my 3DS right now? Anywho, Danny Garrett also gave more data to Oracle to also help coordinate the plan even more, and now the armies of Earth are asking for either clarification or for the Reach's surrender. Speaking of, Guy Gardner arrives to help in the battle on Earth, with some of the surviving Justice League International members, too. It seems the Reach attacking a civilian population violates the treaty with them. Whoops-a-daisy. And with the possibility of their impending death, Brenda and Paco kiss and fight off one of the Reach together. The Negotiator, being a petty sort, decides to activate the devices that would wreck the Earth, but fortunately, Jaime is able to stop them. But it would mean he would die in the blast that would destroy the mothership. But isn't it nice to have a time traveler on your side, as Booster Gold arrives to save the day and rescue Jaime just before the ship explodes. Wayne Enterprises covers the repairs to the town. The remaining Reach gets sent packing by the Green Lantern Corps. They claimed the negotiator went rogue and no one wanted a war. And Kaji Da informs Jaime that he had a secret talk with some of the other scarabs before they left. So, end of the series, right? I mean, seems like a natural end point. Well, no. As I said, the book lasted three years. Unfortunately, the final third is not as good, partially due to John Rogers leaving the series. It's not awful, but it's not as great as the first two years. Issue 26 is a special issue told almost entirely in Spanish, since, well, Jaime is Hispanic, and they decided to take advantage of that to do something unique. The next two issues are enjoyable done-in-ones by Will Pfeiffer before the new writer, Matthew Sturges, took over. He did a six-part storyline called Boundaries that dealt with immigration issues. Like I said, it's not bad, but it's nothing too remarkable. The book was sadly cancelled due to low sales, which makes the ending two issues all the more saddening. The first good thing about it, though? The opening page of number 35 features Jaime taking on a whole bunch of Ted's villains from his solo series, including Fire Fist and the Mad Men. However, Ted was a dude with a giant beetle-shaped airship, and Jaime has alien weaponry that can level cities, so the fight is a bit one-sided. A bunch of scarab infiltrators and enforcers arrive on Earth and talk to Jaime. They are the self-proclaimed Kajida Revolutionary Army. As I said a little bit ago, Kajida had a secret talk with some other scarabs. Revolutionary ideas of their freedom and liberation caused them to start taking out the Reach, liberating forces from what whatever power structures they could find. And unfortunately, they want to do the same to Earth, the Green Lantern Corps, you get the idea. Jaime manages to stop them, but Nadia is killed in the battle and the Scarab forced into a reboot mode. Hector left, pissed of course, but the implication was that one of the rogue Scarabs had taken hold of him. More on that in a bit. It's just a really depressing note to end on. A supporting character killed without a chance for much development, and another one potentially turned into a villain. There are worse ways for a series to end, but there are better ways too. 
Fortunately, this was not the end for Jaime. He continued on in the pages of Teen Titans, but there's not really much to say there. There was a bit of a rivalry between him and Kid Devil, yeah, long story there, The 2003 Teen Titans team probably deserves a retrospective of its own someday. But that ended up getting resolved. Tracy 13 guest starred in a few issues alongside Jaime, but eventually he decided to leave the team, supposedly temporarily, after he became worried about how long it had been since he had seen his family. Unfortunately, Jaime really felt a bit out of place during this run. The problem is really the mood of the book. It wants at times to be lighthearted and jokey with some of its cast, but it doesn't know how to do it, and the art does not help. Under all the shiny coloring, the penciling is a bit atrocious when it comes to facial expressions. Every smile seems so... fake. You've seen a forced smile before. That's what was really prevalent during this run. And because it didn't know how to do lighthearted, the mood was often a bit dour, or just everybody was at each other's throats. It's kind of the exact opposite of the JLI stuff. Everything was too serious, even when it tried to not be serious. But let's move out of the way there, and instead jump over to the pages of Booster Gold! Yeah, remember the weekly series 52 that I mentioned? Well, Booster was a main character in that, and it, well boosted his popularity enough to warrant a solo series. And it was pretty damn good! But there are two things to note with that series. The first is what happened in issue 5. The premise of the series was that Booster was going to be sent on missions throughout history to fix damage to the timeline. However, he had a price to it. He would only do it if he could go back in time and save Ted Kord. Unfortunately, his partner, boss, whatever, Rip Hunter, and he's yet another whole other story, basically he's a time traveler and that's all you need to know about him, tells him it's impossible. There are moments of solidified time that cannot be altered. Oh, that's bullcrap! Another time traveler once said that time was wibbly-wobbly. Not solid! I refuse to believe that time is not jello! However, that changes with the arrival of the Blue Beetle from the 27th century. He's brought both Jaime and Dan Garrett along, Jaime being contemporary and Dan from his early days. The future Beetle claims that Ted needs to be saved for the sake of the unknown champions of time. Rip Hunter doesn't buy any of it, that there aren't any temporal disturbances around Ted, but the future Beetle claims that he has more advanced technology to detect this stuff. What's more, his advanced tech can deal with the solidified time using multimodal reflection sorting. Booster, refusing to believe anything Rip has to say, leaves with the other Beatles in this wonderful little Abbey Road homage. Fortunately, thanks to the events leading up to Infinite Crisis, they know all about Maxwell Lord and arrive just as Max has finished explaining things to Ted. Max almost manages to kill Ted, but fortunately, Booster's goggles take the bullet and Ted beats the snot out of the guy. The future Beetle lays the groundwork that's necessary to bring Max down, and the group flees back into the time stream. The future Beetle also admits that Ted's rescue can never be known to the greater world in order to preserve the time stream. There is a brief detour after this into an event comic, Zero Hour, because of the time travel stuff in Booster Gold, they would often revisit old storylines, and some fun is had. You think they saw us? We're five grown men dressed in bright colors inside of a clear plastic bubble set against a rainbow background, Jaime. They saw us. Well, when you put it like that, it's almost as if superhero comics are silly or something. We get the scenes that we've always really wanted to see. The three Blue Beetles getting a chance to recognize the greatness of the others. Ted even giving Jaime his blessing in the role. Unfortunately, it was all a lie. The Blue Beetle from the future? He isn't. Well, actually, we don't know what his deal is. He's referred to as the Black Beetle. Matthew Sturges created the character, and in an interview, he said that he's very much about the future. But beyond that, we have no idea. At one point, he claims to be Hector, but he then retracts that statement and claims it was a lie. That's the thing about the guy. He keeps changing his story, and at one point, even claims that he is Jaime. At one point during Booster Gold, he steals a red scarab that changes him into, well, the Red Beetle, although they still call him Black Beetle. The only piece of evidence to support the idea he's Hector is that he's referred to by another character as Joshua, which is a pseudonym the rogue scarab had taken on at the end of Jaime series. 
Anyway, the Black Beetle was full of it, and taking Ted out of time, in fact, doomed the world. Maxwell Lord initiated his plans much earlier. The stuff with Infinite Crisis still happened, but differently, and the effects of it are happening out in space, while Maxwell Lord has taken over the Earth and killed most of the superhero population. Booster and Ted reassemble what's left of the JLI and go after Max, defeating him, but then the Black Beetle and his allies arrive. The only way to fix all of this is for Ted to return to his death, and he goes back of his own choice. There's an epilogue that implies Ted may have survived, but it's never really followed up on. It's still a great storyline, and definitely worth a read, if only for the initial stuff with all three Blue Beetles together. But of course, we're not done with Booster Gold. Well, sort of. In 2010, DC decided to try a little experiment with raising the prices of their books from $2.99 to $3.99. To compensate for the additional cost, a number of books received backup stories. And given the characters involved, naturally Blue Beetle was paired with Booster Gold. The first story involves Jaime taking on a giant robot called Thinko who appears to be Neutro's cousin. Thinko also does not know the difference between right and wrong but he spends a lot of time thinking about it. The second story brings up the Black Beetle stuff I mentioned concerning his identity. The more worrying part is that the Scarab is increasingly offering more lethal solutions to Jaime, even going into full infiltrator mode when his sister is injured by the Black Beetle. That thread takes a back seat for two issues, though, for a tie-in to the event comic Blackest Night. I'm actually doing a Patreon-sponsored review of Blackest Night in a few weeks, so we're gonna hold off on that. Only relevant point? Booster Gold and Jaime team up to fight a zombie Ted Cord. Well, there is one other relevant point. They try once again to suggest that epilogue from earlier that Ted survived is still there, but it doesn't go anywhere. Anyway, the final backup feature finds Jaime, Paco, Brenda, and Tracy arriving at the tomb of Ka-F Ray. It's been retconned to be in the fictional nation Bialya instead of Egypt, in the hope that Jaime can find some answers to why Kaji Da has been more bloodthirsty. Unfortunately, the answer is not good. When the Scarab rebooted at the end of the Solo series, it reset its programming to the way it was prior to the two working together. It's become a full-blown Reach infiltrator again. Fortunately, Peacemaker arrives to help knock some sense into Jaime, blowing up the tomb for good measure to prevent this from happening again. The Scarab is reset again, and all's well that ends well. It doesn't have quite as complete a wrap-up as issue 25, but it's definitely a happier ending than the solo series got. We've still got one more thing to cover with Jaime, though. After Blackest Night, there were two bi-weekly series released. Brightest Day, which in the end, apparently existed to bring back... Swamp Thing. I didn't even know you left. But the other series is what we're concerned with. Justice League Generation Lost. See, the end of Blackest Night brought a few characters back to life. Including Maxwell Lord. I should also note that this was during a time when DC had yet again declared, No! Dead means dead! We're not bringing anyone back again! For realsies this time! DC Comics, as inconsistent as Dan Garrett. The book is a maxi-series, lasting 24 issues, and despite the dour tone for a lot of it, it's actually pretty damn good, especially because it does end in triumph. What happens is that with Max's resurrection, the entire superhero community goes after him. Booster manages to track him down, but he and the other remaining members of the JLI are too late to stop his plan, amplifying his telepathic abilities to wipe his existence from the mind of everyone on the planet, even to the point that it creates an altered perception that he's not there. The only five who still remember Maxwell Lord are Booster Gold, Fire, Ice, Captain Atom, and Kajida. Naturally, the Scarab is more than happy to fill Jaime in on what they've missed. They also hook up with a member of the Rocket Reds to complete their JLI reunion, but of course this was all Maxwell Lord's plan. He wanted the group back together again to fight for humanity, since in his own sick, twisted way, he truly believes what he's doing is for the greater good. One annoying thing about this series is that it retcons Ice's origins. Pretty badly, too. It's odd, though. They go through the trouble of retconning Ice for seemingly no reason, 
yet they then try to backpedal on Max's retcons. Despite admitting in Countdown to Infinite Crisis that he had been keeping the Justice League ineffectual for years, we get flashbacks to Max's life later on that match up more with his characterization, even implying that the reason he decided to turn on everyone was because of his mother dying in Coast City during the events of Superman's resurrection, after the goofier days of the JLI. Why is it for every good thing you do around here, we've got to endure three screw-ups? Max's long-term plan is actually that he wants to kill Wonder Woman, which would set off a chain of events that would lead to the moon blowing up in a hundred years. Because comic books! But he's hit a little snag there, DC's shared universe. Yeah, I get the impression that the story actually changed halfway through. Although, that's just speculation on my part. See, J. Michael Straczynski had come over to DC after his exclusive with Marvel had ended, and he took over Superman and Wonder Woman. With Superman, that resulted in Grounded. You remember Grounded, right? Well, if you don't, don't worry. That story is over there, and over there has to take care of its own problems. Wonder Woman he did a bit differently. Namely, he rebooted her. Well, sort of. Basically, it was a storyline about an alternate timeline where Wonder Woman was erased from reality, and she had to try to restore it, even if she didn't remember it herself. Really, the problem with doing that storyline when they did was, well, timing. See, as you may recall, Straczynski didn't actually finish his runs on Superman and Wonder Woman. He was asked by DC to focus all his attention on the Earth-1 alternate universe story that even now people seem to like. I've only skimmed them myself. But the bigger problem was that this storyline about an alternate history and a new costume for Wonder Woman banged right up against the New 52, wherein Wendy's origin was altered and she got a new costume. And even after that, yet another new costume. And who knows what the hell's gonna happen with the rebirth thing. Anyone else starting to get the feeling that the comic industry wants to die and is trying the same tricks over and over again to piss off the readers enough to force them to leave? Jaime is kidnapped by Maxwell Lord so he can study the Scarab's armor, in particular its ability to adapt to new foes and create new countermeasures. Fortunately, Jaime is able to break out and get the rest of the JLI to help. And Max murders him. Well, that's three for three dead blue beetles, retrospective over! So glad I made six episodes worth of material on this! Okay, okay, okay. I've got to admit, this pissed me off back in the day because it felt like they were really going through with it. Because, well, this is DC. They pull this crap all the damn time! But, of course, Jaime is not dead. Well, sort of. Basically, the gun Max fired was strong enough to pierce the armor, but Kajida is a clever little bug. It reinforced the area enough to shatter the bullet, but unfortunately the impact still caused enough of a concussion to fracture his skull and cause a little brain bleeding. Fortunately, the Scarab released some healing enzymes that put him in stasis and fixed him up, so he's good to go. And during his earlier escape, he was able to hack Max's computer and find out all his plans. The good news keeps on pouring in, too. During an earlier fight, Power Girl's memory of Maxwell Lord was restored, and she went and got Batman, who also now remembers Lord. They discover his plot to build something to kill Wonder Woman, hence studying Jaime's armor. This is why I get the impression that the storyline was changed, since the last three issues of this feel rather rushed. It's not so rushed that it's awful, just that it feels like it's dumping a lot of information on us very quickly. Still, it feels like a proper conclusion, combining together everything that's happened over the series. Max stealing various forms of robotics, cybernetics, and genetic engineering, to build a super android to kill Wonder Woman. The android is basically a combination of a Mazo, the Omax, the Metal Men, the Creature Commandos, and Reach Tech. Which means, of course, that Jaime can hack into it and blow it the hell up. Max manages to escape, but not before Captain Adam <coughs> suggests that Max undo his mind wipe of the world so they all remember him. And he does, but later he uploads a video to YouTube explaining himself and his actions in a more humble manner, as if trying to gather popular support. However, Batman is quite proud of what Booster and the JLI were able to do, and thus suggests having them formally start up the Justice League International again. And that book did get made and the New 52, excising the entire reason why it was formed to begin with. 
DC Comics, where retcons are for sale by the dozen. Generation Lost is a great tale, not just for Jaime, but for the other JLI members, retcons notwithstanding. However, it is the Blue Beetle who we are focused on this month, so of course Jaime did great in this. His motivations remained true from start to finish, and ultimately, he was the one who gained vengeance for Ted Kord. Jaime Reyes was more than worthy to live up to the name. He may have been an average student, but he was an above-average superhero, embracing the lessons of those who came before him to not only honor their memory, but to create something unique for himself. His power may have been alien in origin, but like Ted and Dan before him, what made him such a great hero was his humanity. Next week, Blue Skying concludes with another look at Jaime Reyes in the New 52. Do I like it? Well, let my smile say it all. I know you. My brother calls you the crazy one. That's right, baby girl. I'm the crazy one.